Most of what you've been taught about leasing is wrong and I'm gonna prove it to you. We're about to go inside a private training I did where you're gonna learn the most important question you need to ask before you ever think about buying a car and you're gonna learn something I call the eight year rule, which I created for you to be able to clearly see whether buying a car or leasing a car is going to save you more money based on your lifestyle. So grab a pen, let's go inside. The anchor for if you should lease or purchase your next vehicle is something I created called the eight year rule. The eight year rule says if you are not buying your vehicle to keep it at least eight years, you should lease it without breaking the 1.5% rule. So if your answer to how many years are you keeping your next vehicle is not at least eight, you're gonna see in this exercise we're about to do why you should lease your next vehicle, okay? It's not even a question, it's not about opinion, it's not about this judge, Deshaun, I was taught not to lease. You're about to understand why this is all about numbers, depreciation, and resale value. And this is the foundation for how you make sure you don't get the best price on a car and then still lose in the long run, all right? So we have two scenarios, two people in front of us getting the exact same car. They are both buying a Jeep Grand Cherokee brand new. Now, in the end of this exercise, I'm gonna compare a lease, a person who leases to a person who buys pre-owned. So we start here. Two people are buying a brand new $40,000 Jeep Grand Cherokee. $3,000 in taxes and fees. I chose a conservative interest rate. Reason why is because as we go through this, I don't want you saying to shine. Well, that's a high interest rate you use, 7 8%. I'm getting better than that. So I chose a conservative interest rate of 3.99. So if you, you can imagine with interest rates higher, the gap between these two would be even more significant uh, because at these numbers, you're going to see who wins in the short term and when the buyer eventually wins. So this is the scenario. Now, $500 per month on this truck is what I consider a good value lease. Good value lease is all we get. Um, $500, look at the, and you can see, no money down. We are not putting money into either of these transactions because it allows us to clearly see the difference when we're not putting money into the transactions, we can see how much it's truly costing us. So $500 per month, $675 per month is the buyer. So far, who is winning? In the short term, the leaser's winning. $175 per month, richer. Their payment is $175 per month lower. Okay, $2,100 per year lower. Okay, this person has a six year loan 3.99, they are paying $175 more for the exact same vehicle. You with me so far? All right. Now we are going three years down the road and we are, uh, we say the person who bought their car wants to trade it in. This is very common where people buy cars and they, they don't have a long-term lifestyle and this is the decision we want you to make right from the get-go to make sure you are on the right path. You can see here, this person wants to trade, thinking about trading, We, we and, and you can see, brand new, the vehicle is 40,000. The 2025 trading value, three years later, we wanna assume is about 24,000. The vehicle has 36,000 miles on it, that means the person drove average miles, 3, 000, uh, 12,000 per year, and uh, we're conservative there. A $40,000 vehicle brand new is gonna be worth about $24,000 on trade-in three years later with 36,000 miles on it. Now, the loan balance, how much does this person owe? They still owe $23,400 based on a 3.99% interest rate, a six-year loan. So, you can see the person here owes right about what their vehicle is worth. But the person who leased saved $2,100 a year. They paid $175 per month less than them for three years. Meaning in order for the buyer to break even, they would need to get at least $6,300 back. They would need to be at least $6,300 positive 
just to break even with the person who got the good value lease. In this case, them getting $24,000, they only got back $600. The leaser never spent that money. They're $6,300 poorer, and now watch this. The warranty on their vehicle has expired. Most vehicles have a three-year bumper-to-bumper warranty. Some are longer, some is four, but in this case with the Jeep, it was three. Now, so far, this, does, this is nowhere near a win. There's no way the buyer is winning versus the leaser. Let's continue to go to realistic scenarios. What if the buyer had an accident and it was their fault? Now, that truck is not even worth the $24,000. After the accident, they're probably worth $21,000. You lose about twenty. You lose between two and $3,000 of your value when you have an at-fault accident. Okay? Um, $21,500. Now, remember what they owed, $23,400. Now, the truck is worth twenty one five. dollars they have $1,900 of negative equity. They are, they don't even owe, they can't even cover what they owe. So not only are they not getting the $6,300, they're not getting even anything. Now, if the buyer wants a new car, let's just say this person says, you know what, I just want a new car. I don't care what the numbers look like. They would have to pay the difference, which is that $1,900 of negative equity, they'd have to pay that off or they have to carry it over to their next vehicle. They're literally paying for their old car in their new car. This is the formula for negative equity. Happens all the time. It's a breaking of the eight year rule, okay? So let's just say the buyer looks at the numbers, they're smarter and they say, you know what, I'm not gonna trade it. They decide they're gonna keep it until it's paid off, okay? So let's go further down the road. So far, you can clearly see the person who leases is winning. They've paid less per month, $175 per month. Now let's see, you know, let's go, let's, wait, this is three years later. Let's look at the scenario. This person who leased is now about to get their second vehicle because the average lease is three years. We don't do four year leases. So now they're starting their second lease. They're getting the 2025 brand new version and they're still paying $500 per month. Full warranty, brand new truck, latest features three years down the road. The buyer has a warranty that is expired. We are not putting any money into these transactions to say, oh, wait, we could have bought an extended warranty. No, we are keeping it very clean so we can see how much money is going in and who's winning without putting extra money in. The warranty has expired. This buyer is on their own. If anything happens with the car, electrical, mechanical, uh, powertrain warranties covered, but the little things, the bumper to bumper, the full warranty that this person has, this person no longer has, all right? So after six years, Here's what we look like. You can see the person who leased, they're finishing their second lease after six years. They're about to upgrade to the 2028. They've always been under warranty. Anything broke, they took it to the dealership. Dealership fixed it free of charge. This person now who bought, the buyer, has a paid off car. It's six years old. They've driven it 12,000 miles per year. That is 70,000 miles. Now let's look at the numbers. Based on the fact that the leaser is $175 per month lower, their payment is, this person is $12,600 poorer than the person who leased. That's just payments. We throw in another $2,000 for maintenance because over six years, they're probably gonna need to change their tires and brakes. Um, so $2,000 for tires and brakes over six years, they are $14,600 poorer than the leaser. Now, but they have a paid off car though, Deshaun. Yes, they do. So let's see, will they get that money back? And you know, six year old vehicle, brand new, the price was 40,000. Six years old, 70,000 miles, let's assume it has a clean title, they have no accidents. $14,000 is a conservative estimate on what the vehicle would be worth. Remember, it was worth 24 when it was three years old. Has another three years worth of usage, six years old, $14,000 is conservative, right? We're being fair here. 
What if they had an accident or two? In six years, very common to have a one fender bender. So they might not even get the 14. So as we can see in that last scenario, the person needs to get 14,600 just to break even in money. They're lucky if they get 14. And this is where many people will sell this vehicle, trade it, and go right back into another five or six year loan. Happens all the time. This is why this is the foundation of your deal. So let's look at this clearly. If you are the leaser, you paid less every month. After three years, you drove the better car for less because you were not driving the same car once the leaser upgraded to the next version. So the leaser has had brand new cars, new features. Uh, the person who bought, oh, I'm sorry, the leaser was always under warranty. The person who bought was not. Now, what if the leaser invested that $175 per month that they were saving in an 11% mutual fund like someone like Dave Ramsey said teaches you can get? If they invested that surplus, their principal of their investment was $12,600. That's the money they saved in payments. And they'd got, they would have gotten another $4,849 $4, in interest. So now that twelve thousand six hundred is worth seventeen thousand four hundred thirty-nine. Now, over my career, I've had several customers with paid-off houses. They use this very model. They lease vehicles while investing the surplus income. These losses get a lot larger with more expensive vehicles. They do not change. The formula doesn't change. Whether you're buying an S-Class Mercedes, uh, a McLaren, the basis for how you should be determining if you're gonna purchase the vehicle is based on the eight year rule. So, when thing, this is when things really change. When, when does the buyer start to win? After the eighth year of ownership. Because the buyer comes out ahead even with maintenance, why? Because with a lease, you're always gonna have a payment. You cannot change that. The benefit of purchasing, which we'll go into after this lesson, is one of the benefits is you can pay off the car. You can reach something I call the reward stage where you have a paid off car and you have outlived the depreciation curve because the depreciation curve uh, lowers your, 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 your car's value drops tremendously in the first five years of ownership. And once that curve starts to level out, you can now win in the long term. So the eight year rule says if you won't keep a vehicle eight years, and you, and you want the least amount of money coming out of your bank account, you lease. That makes sense? So some of you have asked, people have asked Deshaun, where the eight year rule come from? You now know it's based on math, depreciation, resale values, okay? So to be clear, if your goal is to keep your next car for eight to 20 years, you are what we consider a long-term. This is a long-term vehicle. If your goal is three to seven, your short term and you're gonna you're gonna see it should not be less than three you should the whole purpose of your car shopping is for you to find something I'm gonna show you how to shop how to enjoy shopping this is a major purchase you're about to spend tens of thousands of dollars you deserve to find something that you will enjoy to keep if you're a short-term person at least three years Okay, because cars are not made to be bought and purchased and traded in in two years. They're not made for, you know, anything less than, you know, a three year plan. Okay, so many people will not, you know, will find a car, uh, they'll rush into, you know, buying something and they end up wanting to get out of it in a year or two. That's because they rush. They didn't see all the options. That's not what we do here. You're going to see when we get to day four shopping, that is one of the best parts. Um, you know, of our purchase is deciding what we want, what we're about to spend this ton of money on. So, um, only exception is a bad value lease. Now, we'll talk about that later, but that does not change your decision making. If you are not keeping your car more than eight years, you want to lease and you're going to go into leasing like a boss. If you are keeping your car more than eight years, you are going to go to the purchase to the perfect purchase, okay? Uh, some people say, Deshaun, don't they limit you on lease mileage? 
All right, let's look at this. This is a mistake thinking they limit you on lease mileage. You actually pick the mileage. We pick our own mileage that we're gonna use. So this is how lease mileage intervals are set up. 5,000 miles per year is available on most exotic super luxury cars. Lamborghinis, Ferraris, 5,000 miles a year available on some luxury brands. 10,000 miles per year, um, uh, 7,500 miles per year is actually available on some luxury brands like Mercedes. You can get 7,500 miles per year. 10,000 miles per year is available on most brands. 12,000 miles per year is available on pretty much all brands. 15,000 miles per year, all brands. Up to 30,000 miles per year, most brands. So it does not matter what mileage you drive. They don't limit you on mileage. You pick your mileage based on how much you want to use. Um, and, and we don't skimp on mileage. We don't, if we're gonna drive 20,000, we don't get 10,000, okay? So, there's no limit. So, when you hear people say they only give you 10,000 miles per year, you now have, you, you can now tell them that was a myth, you heard wrong, this was a person who just had bad information, okay? Here's another mistake. Thinking you can drive as much as you wanna drive because you bought the car. You're not gonna escape depreciation. Okay, you are paying. So let's go back to our scenario here and let's look at after six years of ownership, assuming these people both drove 30,000 miles per year. Okay, so let's say we are, we're in a high mileage situation. I want you to know because some of you are either in a high mileage situation or one day you might be. And I want you to know high mileage does not change the eight year rule does not give you the permission to break the eight year rule. So after six years, the person who leased paid 750 per month to lease. They got a good value lease. You're gonna see they paid, you know, a couple hundred more because they are using the vehicle more. So 30,000 miles per year, three year lease. Now, here's what's important. The buyer, the buyer's payment doesn't change. Because, and this is why some people think they're winning. They're, the buyer's still paying six seventy five dollars per month. Vehicle's three years old, they have 90,000 miles on it. So it looks like the buyer's winning. In fact, the buyer is winning so far. The buyer is $75 per month richer, $900 per year richer than the person who leased, right? Okay, let's go down the road a little bit more. So, does the buyer really win? The buyer is $2,700 richer over three years. Again, the buyer is, is saving $900 per year versus the person who leased. But the person who leased paid for their mileage up front. So let's go down the road. The brand new price of the car, we already said this Jeep Grand Cherokee is $40,000. We, the, we already did the math. The amount they owe also doesn't change after three years. They owe $23,400. Now, what is the value of their car with 90,000 miles instead of the 36? 36, we said it was 24,000. 90, conservatively about 15,000. Think about it. Car has almost 100,000 miles on it. People are not going to want to pay anywhere near half of the value of that vehicle. So, 15,000. Now, here's where it gets very ugly for this person who broke the eight year rule. They have $8,400 of negative equity. They either have to pay it off or they have to carry it over to their next vehicle. Now, in this case, the buyer is not. $2,700 richer than the leaser, they're actually $5,700 poorer because the leaser has nothing to worry about. The leaser brings their car back with 90,000 miles after three years, drops it off, and goes and gets their next vehicle. So mileage does not matter when it comes to leasing. If you are a short-term person and you are not keeping your next car more than eight years, it does not matter how much you drive, you are going to see your leasing needs to be a part of your strategy and I'm gonna walk you through the best ways to acquire cars if you are a high mileage driver, okay? But I want y'all having a foundational knowledge 
of the eight year rule. There is no way it ever makes sense to break it. And now let's end with this last scenario. Deshaun, what about I'm buying a used car? This is comparing a, a, a new car to leasing a new car. Okay. Mistake number four is buying a used car, breaking the eight year rule. Just because you are buying a, a used car does not give you permission to break the eight year rule. So let's go back to our scenario here. We can see that the leaser is paying $500 per month. That has not changed. $40,000 vehicle. Now, we, fa we have a buyer here who found a vehicle that was three years old. They paid $26,000 for it. Same vehicle, $40,000 brand new. They got a good deal on it. That's a good deal. They paid twenty six dollars for it. Okay, it has 36,000 miles on it. And now they take out a five-year loan and they are paying $550 a month. Now, here's the scenario. They have no warranty on this vehicle unless they bought it certified. Again, we're not putting any extra money into it. This is just a used car that they got, three years old. They're paying $550 a month based on them buying it for $26. That's what that payment comes out to be. Who's winning so far? $550 a month for a three-year-old vehicle, $500 a month for a brand new vehicle. The buyer is $50 per month poorer. That's $600 per year that the leaser is up. Let's go down the road here. After six years, let's look at the scenario. The leaser is about to upgrade to their third lease. Each lease is three years. So after six years, they're on to their third new, brand new, full warranty, always covered. The buyer who bought the pre-owned car, the vehicle's nine years old now, 106,000 miles. This is based on them driving average miles. They kept it another six years. They put 12,000 miles each year. Vehicle has 106,000 miles on it and it's nine years old. Let's look at the money. $3,600 poorer in payments. That's, that's just what the buyer lost compared to the leaser in payments. $4,000 in maintenance. Let's say they replace the brakes and the tires at least twice. $7,600 poorer overall. So $7,600 is what this vehicle needs to be worth just for them to break even with the leaser. Just on money. We're not even taking into account the fact you know some other things so the buyer needs seventy six hundred dollars this is a nine year old truck now we have to go down the road here nine years old with a hundred and six thousand miles on it no warranty what would what could a person trade this car for maybe seventy six hundred dollars maybe they get the money back <clears throat> maybe they get a couple dollars more it's not going to be much more but what did they drive for the same money that they're trying to break even on. Old vehicle, five years they had no warranty and they paid the same money. Again, not taking into account the the, 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 the actual benefits of the person who leased. This, they're on their third new car. This person's driving an old car. Now, if the buyer keeps the car eight years, starts to make some financial sense. That is where you win. I am not discouraging anyone from buying because in the long term, if you keep the vehicle eight years, 10 years, 12 years, you win. You can app, you pay off the vehicle. We're going to put money to the side to maintain it, keep it moving, and uh, you're going to win with long-term ownership. That's the cheapest way to own a car is to buy it, pay it off, and keep it for and, you know as long as you possibly can. But if you are not going to make it eight years, the numbers do not lie. So, did you enjoy the training? Hopefully you took a lot of notes. Now, you might be thinking, my God, Deshaun, I've lost thousands already not understanding this. Nobody ever broke down leasing versus buying for me. But I don't want you to beat yourself up. Most people are operating with bad car buying advice that they've picked up from well-intentioned people, family, friends, influencers, but they never verified it for themselves. They certainly never looked at numbers. And if you drive more than 18,000 miles per year, you're a high mileage driver. You're losing a lot more money than the average person not understanding these things. But that's not the only myth. If you can't pay cash for a car, you can't afford it. You ever heard that one? Leasing is for people with a business. Leasing is for people who don't drive a lot. What about always negotiate the out the door price? Well, how about the hidden money and the rebate? 
What about this one? There's no way I can get a great deal without being in a dealership. That is the biggest myth. And I want to dispel it in my free masterclass, Secrets of the World's Smartest Car Buyers. You're going to learn how my students all around the country are getting the best deals without negotiating with salesmen, without down payments, and without spending hours in the dealership. Click the link and I'll see you inside.